She shares meals, ritual, work and prayer, but not much conversation. The other sisters shimmer in and out of the narrator's consciousness as she adjusts to the rhythms and tides of life at the monastery. So I'm just going to add to that by um, uh, extending uh, what Dan has said to us about the review by Fiona Wright in The Guardian this morning. It was a beautiful thing to wake up to on launch day. The review says, It is a quiet beginning, spare in its description and detail, but full of foreboding and feeling. There is so much that is unspoken in Charlotte Wood's seventh novel, so much glimpsed and guessed at but never fully seen, an undercurrent of emotion that is all the more powerful for remaining half-hidden. Slow accrual is central to the structure of Stoneyard devotional. It is built of small moments and details, routines and tasks, and the memories they evoke, alongside short interactions and conversations between the narrator and the nuns. The plot is minimal, but finely observed, and because its momentum comes from the growing weight of these incidents and memories, it leaves plenty of space for contemplation. There is work for the reader to do as well. There's so many things I want to talk about today, but I'm going to start just by asking Charlotte to talk to us about the process of that accumulation. I was lucky enough to not literally be by her side, but be by her side as this book began and through the process of it. Can you talk us through how it happened? It's funny, I've been finding it very... Thank you everybody for coming, by the way, and for that lovely welcome, both times. Um, <laughs> I find it really hard to remember the beginning of this process of writing this book. I started writing it pre-COVID, then I went crazy during COVID, as hopefully some of you did as well. <laughs> I'm not the only one. Um, and I, but I, I kept writing into it um, while we we're in lockdowns, in and out of lockdowns, and all the rest of it. And but I kept feeling like I haven't started. I kept throwing large bits away. Um, feeling like, okay, now I'm getting somewhere and then that didn't go anywhere, so I threw that away. So it was a couple of years of feeling like I haven't started, I haven't started. But then, weirdly, something happened in that accreting process that it, it when I finally did get started, I kind of finished it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It seemed <laughs> like a weird process where it was very halting, very slow, very sort of dribs and drabsy, um, but then there were breakthrough moments where things made sense, where characters suddenly, there was a reason for them to be there, and I realised, oh, those two people actually um, are the same person, or that kind of breakthrough, and if you write in this way that lots of writers do, where you don't plan it so, that much in advance. I mean, I had the setting early on, of the Monero, which is where I grew up, and if you don't know where that is, it's south of Canberra before um, the Snowy Mountains. So we would proudly call it the gateway to the Snowy Mountains, <laughs> as the sign says outside town. Um, but that landscape, that very bare, bare, austere that we lunar see landscape. On the cover, of course. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's that's it. And if you open the book out, actually, there's you know on the back side of it, there's it's even more exaggerated that. I think it was Judith Wright who called it a lunar landscape. Um, so I knew I wanted to set a book there. I knew for some reason early on that I wanted to write about nuns because I, I grew up as a Catholic and have, you know, since I was 18 had nothing to do with Catholicism. Um, so I thought, but you know, it gets into your bones if you're brought up in a religious world, I think. Um, and there were things about that upbringing that I really value, even though I do not value the Catholic Church and I not, have nothing to um, say in defence of the Catholic Church. But there, I was interested in what, what on earth would make a contemporary woman become a nun? Like that, I do not get. At first I didn't get it. Um, but after a while I realised there's probably a lot of freedom actually in being a nun, that being in the, I mean you're sort of swapping one patriarchy for another, right, but the capitalist patriarchy doesn't have that much to say for it. 
I think. So I can sort of see why people in communities like this that basically make their own rules, this, this nunnery, this convent monastery, um, it's an invented, a wholly invented place. And the women there just sort of live their lives. They have nothing to do with the church, really. Um, and they, they have a highly ritualised life, as most of these sorts of places do, with their, it's an old sort of, um, the rule of St. Benedict, which is at seven times a day, praying and, but sort of work and worship. So they're self-sustaining sort of communities. Um, so I could see the appeal of that. And then I think COVID, the, the, the kind of whirlwind of COVID and the, um, the kind of stress and drama of COVID, I could see even more the appeal of just vanishing, you know, going somewhere where the outside world doesn't really come in because mm. you don't let it in. You did actually spend a little time at a nunnery. Could you talk about that a bit? Uh, I went to one for a couple of days and um, as a guest, I don't want to talk about where it is or anything because it's, you know, a private place where people do serious work. Um, but I did, yeah, most of these or many of these sorts of monasteries, um, part of their, um, part of their their code is to offer refuge to people, you know, so there are guest houses in places. And also, I should say, my father was a Cistercian monk for a year um, before he, my mother and he got together. Um, and I'd been I there. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, I wrote a book years ago that also involved a monastery. And I went to visit that monastery and spoke to the abbot there. And he sort of told me more about the life that they lived. Um, so, I did go and sort of um, go to these services, you know, three or four times a day for a couple of days. But most of that kind of retreat um, feeling of the book comes from my own experience of various retreats that lots of writers go on, you know, this Arthur Boyd's property, Bundanon, that's an artist retreat, there's Varuna in the Blue Mountains. Um, but also I, you know, various of our writing friends go away to work um, and you do spend lots of time in silence and, and it sort of becomes slightly ritualised, not in the same way obviously, but it wasn't hard to imagine that, um, that rhythm and um, the sense of just the rhythms of days of being outside the normal world. Mm. And you've actually just recently returned from Japan. Is there something about the stillness, the small spaces, the noticing? Tell us about that. Yeah, we just went to Japan for 10 days, um, came back last week, and I'd never been there before. And of course, I loved the gardens and the temples. Um, not that we went to very many, but I'm very drawn to that sort of Templeish life, I think. I mean, I could never do it, but but I see the beauty of it. I see the the order of it. Although in both my book and in the, my favourite temple in Japan, a leaf blower was in action, <laughs> which is, as far as I'm concerned, a complete denial of everything that has to do. Uh, so that was outrageous. Um, but I think what interests me about that sort of life is, you know, there's, there's a lot of romance about it, right? It looks beautiful, it looks, I mean, it looks beautiful, not in Australia, I've got to say, um, but uh, there's a fantastic Spanish film called Free. If you get to see that, it is beautiful. And it's about, it's interviewing nuns and monks in all these Spanish monasteries. Now, if you're a nun or a monk in Spain, A, you get amazing food, <laughs> and B, they're beautiful, you know, the outlooks are all beautiful. Whereas in Australia, you know, the one where my dad was um, at Tarawara, it's just spindly little weatherboard, crappy old buildings in pretty, on pretty crappy land. You know, there's nothing really beautiful about it in that centuries of tradition sense. So, but 
so there's romance about the life you lead there, but also I think it's very hard, that life, because, well, certainly my narrator goes there as a form of sort of escape. But of course, you know, it's not original to say that there is no escaping the self mm. and there's no escaping the fact that you have to live with other people. And a lot of the kind of tension in the book is this tension between... Um, you know, engaging with the world or opting out of the world. What's what's the best way to live? And the narrator is sort of asking herself. You know, there's two sort of quotes that she picks up on early on. The first is it's attributed to Joan Baez. I'm not sure. I think probably lots of people have said it. But you know, action is the antidote to despair, which is something I've always believed. And then, when the pandemic happened and we all had to stop. You know, there was all those stories of, you know, fish coming back into waterways and the skies, you know, birds appearing where they... So and if we had just stopped, um, maybe maybe acting all the time is actually destroying everything, you know. So the other, the other um, sort of mantra that she's torn between is, is action is the antidote to despair or first do no harm. And these people are living these lives out in the middle of nowhere doing no harm, you know. And my narrator sort of first, when she goes there, she sees them going in and out of church all day and sort of thinking, how do they get anything done? You know, they're just, they're out there doing what the gardening or whatever, and then suddenly, bing, the bell goes and they've got to toddle into mm -hmm. church. And then she realises, oh, this isn't an interruption to the work. This is the work. Mm -hmm. The praying is the work. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know what prayer, she never figures out through the process, through the time of the book, what prayer is. She doesn't understand it. Um, I don't understand it. But, um, you know, they're doing no harm. It is that actually lovely kind of... Um, this is not a redemptive book, even though it is. It's, it's not a book where she suddenly takes to the life. Mm. Um, nothing is solved for her. Through uh, a long period of depression once, I used to live near the Botanic Gardens and I used to walk around every day thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I used to look over at Garden Island and think, if I was just in the Navy, I would have <laughs> <laughs> something to do. No, I totally now, get it. It is kind of funny, but I also, it was just like, I don't, uh, depression is not knowing what to do with yourself. But also, I feel your, your life is mapped out for you in yeah. some, in these sort of, highly regimented places, you don't, there are no decisions to make, mm. it seems. Mm. But I think that part of that, I think anyone living that kind of life would go, oh, yeah, right, mm. of course there are decisions to make about the self, about, you know, your own ego, about what you want, what you're, you're you know, living in close quarters with people you have not chosen to live with, mm. it's not fun, it's not mm. easy. Mm. Um, so, but that's, I mean, you can see the appeal, and I think a lot of people, I mean, I've, in my research, which consists of nothing, um, <laughs> you know, Googling around here and there, there's a few little bits of documentaries here and there, and, and there's one in some um, contemplative order in, in the state somewhere, and the, you know, older nuns saying, we get a lot of, we get a lot of young women coming here saying, oh, this is what I need, you know, I need to, Escape. I need to have this. All this stuff we're talking about. They get here and find out it's fucking hard. Mm -hmm. It's very hard because mm -hmm. you're pushed up against yourself. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, we can, you know, distract ourselves from our own, you know, the mirror, mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, what, what mm -hmm. my narrator is pushed yeah. up against all the time. Yeah. Um, Charlotte and I are both big readers of the um, British writer James Wood and he once said to notice is to rescue, to redeem, to save life from itself and Charlotte and I have often talked about the notion of um, that, that comes from James Wood of what he calls the serious noticer. This is really a description of Charlotte as a writer. Every time I read a new novel by her I find myself lingering over the detail so for me, the gift bags given to the women at the end of The Natural Way of Things. When I first read that, I, well, in our writing group we call it Victory Lap. I did a Victory Lap. 
My, my favourite thing in the weekend was the inclinator, juddering up, <laughs> <laughs> presenting bad news and terrible people. And now uh, the detail of memories and observations in Stoneyard Devotional. I wonder if we could talk about the detail in Stoneyard Devotional, how it came to you, how you pursued it, and where you found it in the reaches of your memory. Mm. You mean the detail about the the, the, the sensory the detail, the things, mm. the places. Yeah, so a lot of the book is is drawn from memory, so it is. It's probably my most personal book, really, um, because the narrator spends a lot of time thinking about her mother, who died when the narrator was in her twenties, um, as my mother died when I was in my twenties. Um, our mother, my sister Louise, here somewhere, um, and so there are there are memories of times with my mother that were very potent. So she spends a lot of time in this place. One of the things that I did hear a nun say in one of these um, documentaries was that you your memory suddenly opens up when you're in this sort of quiet. You suddenly flooded with memories that in ordinary life you sort of are too distracted to let in probably. So my narrator thinks a lot about her mother because this is in near the town where she grew up um, and on the way there for the first time she visits her parents grave for the graves for the first time in 30 years. Um, and I did find memories of things in the town just sort of flickering out of nowhere I mean, I think they're memories, but I don't know that they're memories. You know that, and one of the, um, I've got two epigraphs for the book, and one of them is from Elizabeth Hardwick's um, book, Sleepless Nights. And she says, I will do this work of um, transformed and distorted memory. And that's what I, I kind of wanted that there to say, some of this is memory, but it is necessarily distorted, and some of it, maybe isn't memory, maybe is something that I think I remember, you know that, especially from early childhood. So there was um, times with my mum, who was a quite an interesting person, a, quite a, uh, a very private sort of person, um, someone who I felt by the end of her life, I didn't... I just felt she was just had a great privacy about her, and I'm I don't know that my siblings have this feeling about her at all. And, you know, all I have four siblings, and the woman in the book is an only child. Um, but I didn't want to tread on any of my siblings, you know, relationships with our mother. But um, so it's a the portrait of the mother in the book is a very it's a version of my mum, and but. There seemed to me about her, and for the narrator about her, a great... that the mother needed a sort of privacy and that the daughter would always respect that privacy. She never felt like, oh, I want to know things. She was just like, this is who she is and um, I respect that. So there are things about... I don't know, sensory... I think things when you're child, from your childhood are very... You know, we have very potent memories of sensory things, I think. Um, and then the other sort of details, I guess, are, are invented mostly. Um, invented and imagined, yeah. So um, James would quote uh, another critic, Christopher Ricks, quotes him as saying, a fairly good test of literary quality is if a sentence or image or phrase of a writer comes to your mind unbidden when you're just walking down a street. So I'm going to ask Charlotte to read a little from the book to see if we can feel that sort of unbidden quality. So Dal's just from there to there. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is the narrator's voice. When I was living in Surrey Hills and still working at the Threatened Species Centre, not long after Alex had gone to her husband, I came home late one night 
which was not unusual. But this time I entered my room and saw a coil of bedsheet twisted into a lump where I'd left it on waking that hot morning. A pillow was on the floor and clothes and papers and notebooks and the iPad were massed on the unoccupied side of the bed. I was so tired but the mess on my bed, the same congestion into which I had nightly crawled without noticing, was suddenly intolerable to me. I yanked at the sheet and the motion sent everything to the carpet. I lifted the sheet with two hands and it billowed slowly back down and as it did I felt some otherworldly possibility open up inside myself. I picked up one of the pillows from the floor and placed it back on the bed, smoothed the sheet down to make a flat, empty expanse. I stood looking at the bed and breathing. It isn't something I ever told anyone. How could you say this? But the lift and descent of that sheet, the air inside it, the peace when it settled, showed me what I wanted. I knew it in that moment, but it took years to find it. Let's, let's just um, sort of come in a bit. Let's talk about that scene and the writing of that scene, the sentences, the movement of them. Can you remember writing that scene? Can you remember a lifting of a sheet of your own? Yeah, I remember writing that scene. I remember I was writing the book, I was up at the coast of the house that we rent up there. And I had that feeling, I guess, I, you know, if I'm there on my own, there's a lot of mess around me because I don't have to um, you know, look after anybody else. But that, you know, that sense of a newly made bed, you know, Helen Garner's always on about beds um, and sheets and that sort of the peace of a newly made bed. Um, yeah, I, I, it's funny. I remember talking to Vicky about it, that uh, dear writing friend, that day, actually, I think, after I'd written that. I thought, it sounds ridiculous. She, goes, well, she made a bed and then she realised that she wanted to, you know, go be a nun. <laughs> she didn't really want to be a nun, but she wanted that sense, I suppose. And I think the thing about the air inside it, there was something about that, that well, you know, the sl it's the slowness of the sinking of the top sheet as it floats down. I mean, these things are just, they're not things you can think about in advance, are they, really? You know, you have to just notice them. Um, and when you're in a good writing um, mode, you are noticing everything. And you, and it, it's about being um, quiet, I suppose, mm. that sort of noticing um, ability. You need a certain level of stillness to, a certain level of stillness to notice the thing and then a certain level of confidence to go, I can make that thing mean this thing, you know, because it doesn't mean anything, making a bed. But you can, I think a lot of it's about tone and voice. Um, and for this book, that, that tonal, I mean, I keep coming back to the word austerity, which I've used all the way through um, thinking about this book, that it's an austere uh, voice and the, you know, the, the narrator doesn't have a name and that's part of the, the stripped back sort of nature of the, of the, the voice and the story, I guess. Um, Let's, let's just have a, another little look at the sentences because I want to um, remind us of movement in the sentences. The sentences are so often overlooked <laughs> and they're all we do. Um, I lifted the sheet with two hands and it billowed slowly back down. So billowed and slowly together are doing something. You can feel that OW. Um, and as it did, I felt some otherworldly possibility. Again, you hear that OW. Open up inside myself. I picked up one of the pillows from the floor and placed it back on the bed, smoothed the sheet down to make a flat, empty expanse. So can you see with flat, empty expanse the way that you get the flattening of the billowing? So these are the things that not all readers will notice. Um, 
as they're reading, but if you slow down, which is what this book asks you to do, you get to notice not just what Charlotte's saying, which is important, what she's seeing, which is important, but what she's doing as well on the page, this intimacy. I think that's what books do when... I remember when I first read um, the Lucy Barton book, the Elizabeth Strout, My Name is Lucy Barton, that first one. And the first time I read it, I was in too fizzy a kind of state. And I was just like, ah. Oh. I loved Olive Kittredge. And then I was like, great, his new one. And I was kind of like, and I couldn't get it. Like I just thought, I don't understand why everyone thinks this is so great. But I knew it was me, not the book. I knew there was something in me that wasn't in the right space to read it. Anyway, then I went back to it in a, in a quieter sort of headspace, I suppose. And then I thought it was unbelievably magnificent. But it had to be me being in a noticing frame of mind <coughs> to read it mm. and to hear it, to hear those those sorts of writers who I really love now, who are kind of my, my most precious ones, you know, the Joan Silvers and Elizabeth Strouts and Sigrid Nunes. And Joan London. Joan London. Um, the, the confidence to be that quiet mm. is so impressive to me now. Um, but it took me a long time to to develop that confidence, even as a reader, to be honest. Um, but as a writer, I'm really interested in that now. Like it's it's sort of it might sound weird to a lot of readers to say you need confidence to to not. I think I used to be much more anxious as a writer about making sure that no one was going to be bored or. Um, I mean, plenty were bored, let me tell you, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, to make sure everyone understood exactly what I was trying to do, so I'd over-explain a metaphor or whatever. And now I'm just like, I don't care about any of that anymore. Mm -hmm. I just want to leave a lot of space for the reader, because as a reader, that's what I... Sorry, banging that microphone. Um, as a reader, that's what I love. The space for a book to open up all sorts of things in my mind about my life that aren't about the thing in the book, but you know, the book has made that possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> James Wood um, says, it is by noticing people seriously that you begin to understand them. By looking harder, more sensitively at people's motives, you can look around and behind them, so to speak. Often in life, i felt that an essentially novelistic understanding of motive has helped me begin to fathom what someone else really wants from me or from another person. Sometimes it's almost frightening to realise how poorly most people know themselves. It seems to put one at an almost priestly advantage over people's souls. So a book is life slowed down. Um, that's... that's that's what it does for us, it slows our breathing down, but it also is a tool for reading people. And Charlotte's spoken about some of, some of the authors that are important to her. I wondered if you could tell us more about that. Maybe, maybe take us right back and tell us what authors started to teach you to read the world. Hmm. They just change all the time, you know. Um, there are constant people like Helen Garner, um, Joan London has always been very important to me. Um, but as a child, I read absolute crap, you know, I didn't read proper books. Um, I just read anything, but nothing. I know, you know, your childhood books are so kind of present to you, whereas mine are just in a blur of, you know, kind of rubbishy. Edith Blyton, whatever. She wasn't rubbish. Well, <laughs> but I've got, yeah. I have no attachment to that, that sort of childhood or, or young reading. I feel like, I don't know. I don't know. I find that weirdly hard to answer. That's okay. okay. Maybe we'll come back to it. I want to talk also about um, the body of work. This is an expression that, that we share a bit. Charlotte now has a body of work. Um, there are so many fabulous books. There are so many ways of knowing Charlotte. 
what does it feel like to look back on a body of work? Does it feel like a body of work? Mm. No, it feels like oh, I've finally started to understand how to write a book <laughs> now. But it, I don't know, it feels like looking back at, at one's adolescent self a lot of the time, which I do not enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, I feel like I'm practicing. I'm lear- I'm, yeah, I feel like all the time I'm starting to learn something and I've never fucking learned it. <laughs> but I'm just, I feel with this book, this book feels like I've started to get somewhere. I mean, the natural way things did make a big, mark a big shift for me. Um, but, you know, the books that are most popular in the world are often not the author's favourite books, and that is not my favourite of my books. But um, I'm grateful to it because it did change a lot of things for me. Um, what is yeah. your favourite of your books? <laughs> I know you all want to know. <laughs> This is my favourite, but actually the favourite's always the next one, right? Mm-hmm. It, it is, I think. But this is, I'm happy with this book yeah. in a way that I had n- not really been before, I think. Mm-hmm. That might change, but I feel like it's, I feel that it's my most mature work. <laughs> Maybe because I am a, a mature <laughs> lady. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, with the body of work in mind, do you know what comes next? I don't need you to tell everybody what your new book is about. I just mean... I have an idea for a book, and I I realised recently that my books have tended to fall into this pattern of what I call in the world and out of the world. And my first couple of books were quite otherworldly, and then... um, there was a book called The Children and then Animal People, which were very much realism in the world, contemporary. Um, and then there was The Natural Way of Things, which was kind of, you know, people taken out of the contemporary world. The Weekend was in the world, this one's out of the world. The next one's going to be back in the world. And this is this tension, I think, that's in me all the time between removing myself from the world, as the narrator does, and and the kind of obligation to engage with the world. You know, we, we, we have to live with each other um, and engage in all kinds of ways, politically and otherwise. And yet, you know, a lot of the time I just want to run screaming for the hills and hide from all of that. So there's this continual tension, I think, in me between wanting to be a part of a, an engaged community and wanting to run like hell from that. So the next one is going to be definitely back super in the world. world. In the world. And um, we're coming to a point where I'm going to open up for you guys to ask questions. I am going to repeat your questions, as Dan said to us, so for the people listening to the live stream at home, they can hear what the question actually is. And I guess I'll just take a minute to say, questions are just so welcome and so much a lively part of this. If you could make them questions. (laughs) <laughs> that would be really great. I know, I know, it's a conversation and um, I really understand the urge to say what you've experienced because that means that the book's spoken to you, so I really respect that, but a question for Charlotte would be great. But before we go there, I'm just going to just pull focus one more time um, and just to the extent that Charlotte is comfortable with, but she's spoken about this in the paper, Charlotte's last year uh, has been a difficult one. Can you? you? Yeah, so um, it's interesting talking about this with my sister Louie in the room. Uh, Last year, my sister Lou and I and our other older sister Bernie all got breast cancer. Uh, Within the space of six weeks, we were diagnosed uh, as um, we all got tested after the first one and then. Um, and so it was a it was a very shocking year. Um, we're all fine now. Lou had by far the worst um, experience, but it was deeply shocking and deeply. It sort of removed 
removed us once again from, we'd had the sort of pandemic lockdowns and I felt like last year was another giant lockdown for each of us in different ways. Um, I had just finished a draft of this book and then I, like I literally just wrote the kind of crucial end scenes and thought, oh thank God I've got the draft and then I went to the shops and while I was there got the phone call from the breast screen people saying, can you come back in? And, and our older sister had already been diagnosed and I was like, holy fuck. Um, so everything went, you know, there was no work done for a lot of time. But so then, I mean, the point of talking about it here is that when I went back to the book, it was with this kind of newly um, austere, um, Feel, stripped back feeling, I guess, of chastened. You yes, used that chastened. Well, the other um, epigraph I have in the in the book is from Nick Cave, and he said, "I felt chastened by the world um, after the death of his son and the pandemic." And yes, I felt newly chastened. So it was almost like I'd already been aiming for this kind of um, stripped back, um, sort of bare quality in the book. But then my life kind of caught up with what I was trying to do in the book. And, and what it did for the book is, is, was gave me even more confidence to just double down on that and not try and not sort of get scared of leaving too much space or, you know, not... Um, I might have otherwise wobbled a bit and thought, oh, I should be a bit more reassuring to a reader. And then it was like, nah. <laughs> You know, and I think you know everyone in this room has been through some major crisis, I would say. And when those things happen to you, your world, you know, there are ordinary trivial things don't register in the same way that they used to. And in fact, it can make you quite hard to be around, I think. <laughs> you know, someone complains about the line at the post office. <laughs> And you're like, who gives a fuck about the person? <laughs> um, so I suppose the relevance of it to the book was that it, when I went back into the book to rewrite it, it needed a lot, a lot of work. I went back to it with this kind of a cooler eye, a more, more determination to, to write the kind of book I want to write, whether or not anyone likes it, because life's short. So, um, so I think it, it, that sort of infuses the book in a way that hopefully you wouldn't have a clue about that experience, except I'm now blabbing about it all over the country. But, yeah. but the book, and the book uh, had that already, had that already. Yeah. yeah. It, it was, was weird. There. It, and yeah. Yeah, there's a bit in the beginning where the narrator talks about um, when, she, when her mother was dying, and she felt that her friends had all abandoned her and her, her counsellor said, look, they're not trying to hurt you, it's just that your life has been stripped back to bedrock and theirs are still cushioned by all the other normal things of life. And so I guess when I went back, it was like an even more layer of bedrock that I was going into it with. Um, but I think that, I think it helped the book. So much that Charlotte's given to us to think about tonight, and I'm sure you'll want to speak to that. So if anybody has any questions now, is a really good time to ask them. Yes? Um, you, the passage that you read out earlier, it almost takes your breath away, because I think most people in the room can not only from your description, but like be there with the feel of the sheet and the flatness and as a writer, when you're writing that, does that take your breath away in the moment? Does it, the joy of capturing an emotion that's like quite difficult to mm -hmm. sum up your words? Just got to read that. Yeah, thank you for that question. So the question was about the passage that we read about the, the billowing of the sheet um, and whether as a writer you know in the moment whether that that's a going to work. Is that kind of, <laughs> that, that you've captured it. Um, I, think, I think I do now. Uh, 
I do think growing as a writer is a matter of learning to more and more to trust your instinct. And what you, so you, the difficulty is having that, finding that, you know, amazing scene, a metaphor or whatever, but then making it fit with other things, you know. So on its own, it might work, but everything around it has to also, it has to fit in properly. Um, but I think, I think what, what you have to trust is that it, it meant something to me so I have to just trust that it will mean something to the reader. And that's quite hard to trust, to learn to trust that. Because I think in my younger writer days, I would think, oh, they won't know what I mean. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's just making a bed. So I'd have to put in a whole lot of some explaining things around it or something. But I think, in fact, the only if that works, it's just because there's no explaining anything. Um, and that takes a lot of time to learn to trust that you don't have to say everything. And in fact, it's much more pleasurable as a reader to not, you know, to be given some credit for your intelligence. So, um, yeah, I think I'm better at recognising now. I mean, there's a million that you think work and then, you know, you read them a day later and they're like, yeah, it does not work. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of throwing out. So you, you keep the ones that do, that work you know, the tenth time you read them, mm -hmm. not just the first time. Mm -hmm. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Susan. Um, Charlotte, another scene that seems to have an impact on readers, and I haven't yet read the book, um, is the mouse plague. And I wondered if you could talk about writing that. Did you live through a mouse plague? How did you create that drama of these Oh, the mouse creatures? plague. <laughs> so, <laughs> Susan Wyndon has asked a question about the mouse plague in the book. There is a mouse plague. Um, I've had a couple of readers say to me, oh, I can't wait for you to read a book, but I just can't do mice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not going to read it then. Um, there's a mouse plague, and I have never lived through a mouse plague um, because where we grew up, it was too cold for m mice plagues. And in the book, it's a, you know, it's a bit of a stretch to s say that it, it's happening in that area. But there is also climate change, and we are also experiencing things for the first time that have never happened before. So, and apparently, one did actually come quite close recently. But no, I I have not. But I did visit my friend in the Central West um, during a mouse plague, and that was quite something. Um, I could only bear it because the room that I was sleeping in was one of the two rooms that the mice couldn't. It was a newer part of the building. This is an old farmhouse, so anyway, it was pretty interesting. It was interesting to me, I mean, it was, you know. Describe. Well, they just, the reason I've used the mice in the book, they're kind of just an unseen, skittering, creepy thing around all the time, but a lot of the time you can't see them. I mean, you can see them when you wake up in the night and they're crawling all up the... Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> People are clutching their heads in the audience. Um, up the fly screen, on the outside of the fly screen. So there is a kind of... It's, there's something very shocking about a plague, right? It's got... It's got it, there's something disturbing about it at a level that isn't about the thing itself because, you know, they are just little animals, but there's something kind of terrifying to us about a plague, I think. It's got biblical evocations. It's got this sense of being overrun by something we can't control. And we are not good at accepting that we can't control things. So, um, but yeah, so I stayed with my friend Ali for a few days and I, who am like the, I am the jump on a chair screaming if you see a mouse, you know, cartoon woman was after a couple of days picking up traps with three or four mice <coughs> in them, emptying it, setting them again, within minutes, bing, 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 all they go off. I mean, it was full on. And, but this the relentlessness of it for her. Like, I left, <laughs> I was like, bye. But <laughs> they were still, you know, they, they kept on for ages and ages. Did you know then that you were going to put it in this novel, Ray novel? Uh, I, I don't know, there's something about it that, 
I was like, I, I, come on, this is gold. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But also, there's this sense for the for the women. There's there's a whole strand that we haven't talked about, which is there there are two visitations to this, two other visitations to this monastery, which is um, a, a, a sort of activist, radical, environmentalist nun called Helen Parry, who comes and gets stuck there because of the pandemic. But she comes to return the bones of another nun called Sister Jenny, who has left this community. Um, a long time ago to work in Thailand with poor women and then disappeared and was presumed murdered. And her bones have been brought back by Helen Parry to be buried at the monastery. But there's this time where they're in this kind of um, treading water where they're waiting for permission to get the official permission to get do the burial. And all the time these mice are running around, they're trying to keep the coffin of Sister Jenny protected from the mice. So it's this sort of, you know, there's this, um, there is all this sort of quiet um, interior stuff from the narrator, but there's also this sort of the landscape of action I called it today in the other talk about the, this constant battle to try and control the mice to keep them away from this, this coffin of skeletal remains. Um, and then there's Helen Parry talking about it, and she's another kind of um, uh, invasion, really, because her presence shows these women up. Really, she's a she's a an activist. She's a doer. She thinks, "What the hell are you people doing, sitting here praying? What the fuck is that doing for the poor people of the world?" And the so it's this sort of great disruption that happens with the mice and Helen Perry. It's a very long answer. Mm -hmm. Just on the mice. Because I, I have read the book. You talked before about your books being in the world and out of the world. And listening to you talking there then, are the mice bringing the world into mm. this book? And that's, that's the mechanism you have. Of, of get, there's, there's so much space. You can see it in the photo. You can see your comfort in that space now. And that lovely photograph of you down in the Monero in the paper, it's a smile, I mean, <laughs> that you're so comfortable now in that kind of volume. And do you, it is part of the mice mm. to also bring the world back in. Mm. So they're busy. I world. think that's very astute, Keith. So this question was, are the mice bringing the world in? <coughs> this is my out of the world book, but the mice, are the mice bringing the world in? I think that's right. They're certainly bringing the threat yeah. Yeah. in. And as is Helen Parry, mm. and they are sort of arrive sort of together. Um, yeah, I think that's right. And they're also bringing in the disturbance of the natural world um, that that is wrong. You know, this shouldn't be happening in this place. And this woman has been working in you know environmental circles. Um, but that's right. I hadn't thought of it like that. But I think that's right. Thank you. You may do all my events from now. There's <laughs> <laughs> a question at the back. Charlotte, um, did you um, go back to the Monero to write about it? Or did you really draw on your imagination and memories of the area? Thank you. The question was, did I go back to the Monero to write about it? Or did I just draw on memories? Um, I did go back only for a very little space of time, really, because um, I hadn't been back for a long, long time, really. I mean, we still have friends there and, you know, sort of pass through town once or twice. And we do have some very lovely family friends who live on farms down there. Um, but I had not been back. But I did, once I started writing about it, I was very lucky to have some very nice, generous friends who had a... Um, a holiday house, if you could call it that, uh, which is a converted church in Berrydale. Um, and that was, and I was there for a week by myself in the middle of winter. And that was fantastic because A, it was a church yeah. and it was freezing cold. Um, I mean, the place was warm when you put the fire on and everything, but it was really good and kind of strange to be back there alone um, 
with all of these memories of my childhood, sort of every driving around going, oh my God, that's right. Oh my God, what about that? You know that thing where a place can, places like smell or music or something, you know, it can just suddenly torrents of memories um, come back. And um, so it was, and I took heaps of photographs and just drove around. Um, and wrote quite a lot while I was there, actually. And then went back a couple of other times here and there. Um, but it's very potent. The landscape is so austere. I mean, the landscape kind of drove the tone of the book, really, or created the tone of the book. Um, so, yeah, I did a little bit go back. We've probably got time for just one more question. Yes. My question's about, um, have you written about groups of women for your last few novels? I was wondering how you have about that choice. Yeah, why do I keep writing about groups of women? Um, <laughs> I did grow up in a family of four sisters and one poor brother, um, which I presume is where some of that comes from. I don't know. Maybe you can ask my sister who's here. Um, but I've always been... I had groups of friends, of women friends. I'm interested in, in, I think I'm interested in how to get along with people in a group for some reason. I suppose that comes from growing up in a big family, I guess. Um, because there are so, and I've, and I've written about families before, you know, which is another kind of group dynamics, I guess. Um, I suppose in a way I can't imagine not living, I mean I live with my husband by myself, we don't have any kids or parents around or anything, so I live in a, you know, not in a group, but I'm, like I'm really fascinated by people who, who want to live in communes and stuff like that, that's just my idea of hell on earth, <laughs> but it's, there's just lots of interesting power shifts that go on in groups that, that are different from couples, you know, or, or pairs. Because there's that way that um, allegiances change and shift and, and you know, tides come and go of um, closeness and distance to people. And, and I don't know why the groups of women thing has become so important particularly. Um, I guess just because I'm a woman, I suppose. But, I don't know. I don't know why it's so interesting to me. I think a lot. I know. One, I think a lot of the time with women, the power dynamics are kind of buried because we're not allowed to have. We're not allowed to be competitive, or we're not allowed to be jostling for. Like men are much more open about that sort of stuff, whereas I think women are, are less comfortable with being open about that even though it happens everywhere all the time and that's what's interesting to me is it's all happening and we're all pretending it's not happening or something <laughs> but uh, yeah I don't know the next one's not well actually not, <laughs> <laughs> not only women there's one more Do we we've got time just for this one last one oh, sorry there behind you there's a <laughs> So it's about whether the, the nuns in particular... Were they useful for... Were they useful to offer my narrator any kind of um, resolution? Any or any kind of yeah. Yes, except experience. they're not. I mean, the thing is, I think what I find interesting about, about religious people, I mean, not the, you know, insane ones, but the, I'm interested in 
that kind of religious person who I actually think there's probably quite a lot of nuns and priests who don't believe in God, you know, who actually just want to live a life where they're doing so. They feel at home in a place and in a community and they can do what their idea of good work is there. In fact, I know at least one, possibly two priests who I feel pretty sure don't believe in God. Um, but it doesn't matter, like it doesn't enter, it's not a question for them, you know. So I think what was interesting to me about creating these nuns, so there are these like six or seven of them in this place along with my narrator and one of them, Simone, who runs the place is super, super smart and, and she's a questing, she's a very practical person but she's also a questing person about how to live an ethical life. And um, I think a lot of these people are concerned with that question of how to live an ethical life and have the time and space to, to consider it. Now, I hear what you're saying about, you know, especially if you've grown up with nuns, a lot of whom were completely barking, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, but, yeah, to choose that life now is very different from choosing that life in 1950, I think because there are, there are all these other choices available to us now that weren't available to lots of women then. Um, yeah, so sorry, I have not answered that question, but maybe. <laughs> I think we're done. I think that just about warrants